What the fuck? It's definitely some type of monkey called a marmoset, but I really don't know what in the hell. Okay, full disclosure, I just Google image marmoset and just kept scrolling until I found it. This is a silver marmoset. Except this one looks like it'd ruin your life and your property value if he ever gets wet. You can find them in the Amazon rainforest, primarily in Brazil. As marmosets, they're one of the most fun-sized monkeys in the world. The biggest ones are only like 12 ounces. That's about as heavy as a can of soup. Like us, they're omnivores, meaning they'll eat anything that isn't nailed down. Including fruits, bird eggs, insects, and the occasional lizard. And I know what you're probably thinking. No. They're horrible pets. They bite and they have claws. Because they're social, it wouldn't be enough to have one, you'd have to adopt an entire family. Silvers are also loud and they'll shout as a group to mark their territory. Another way they claim their hood is by febrezing the area with a scent produced from their swimsuit area. So, if you want a screaming, biting, peeing loudspeaker in a baby face package, yeah, they're the pet for you. Or you know, you could just have kids. They're basically the same, but only one of them gives you tax breaks. I actually had to go back and check. You've actually been doing this for 87 days, and I'm, I'm impressed. That also means everyone can blame you for this video. This is creates and not as Genghis, but it's also known as the hen type of tentacle moth. Tentacle moth. And it's as real as real gets. And it's found in, you know, you know exactly where. Southeast Asia, but it's also seasoned throughout Australia. Now what this moth is doing is actually perfectly harmless. Those are sense organs that produce pheromones, and pheromones are basically a Batman symbol for horny moths. When they're not trying to get laid, they look a lot less like they were airdropped by Satan. Also, tentacle moths aren't the only ones. A lot of butterflies and moths also have these scent glands called cormata that they use to get and keep a female's attention. It's also called a hair pencil. When a female shows interest, the male will seal the deal by fanning his hair pencil, basically for breezing her with pheromones to get her to respond by flicking her antenna. And when it's not standing at attention, it's stored in the male's abdomen until he needs it. Lots of butterflies and moths have it. This one just looks like it came from the wrong side of Wattpad. Florida has a serious herpes monkey problem that nobody knows what to do about. And like all bad things in the world, it's somehow our fault. It all started in the 30s when six Reese's macaques, these guys, were released on a small island on what is now Silver Spring State Park in Florida. I guess they wanted to make it a Tarzan type thing, but here's where they f***ed up. They could swim. As soon as the monkeys touched down, they swam to the mainland and started wilding out. After years of plot development, what started with six monkeys is now escalated to over 600. And a good number of those monkeys are ubers for herpes. Not only that, but a good number of those monkeys will shed the virus through their saliva. So not only do we have herb drooling monkeys, it means all it would take is one love bite for you to get absolutely f***ing folded. And if you do manage to catch it, symptoms can include severe brain damage and an empty seat at your family reunion. Now full disclosure, it is incredibly rare to catch the herb from a monkey. Last time a person got hashtagged by one was in 1997 and that was in a lab. That doesn't mean they're not a menace. The more these monkeys associate humans with food, the more they lose their fear of us, the less f***s they're obligated to give. There have already been cases of monkeys pressing entire families for food, and it's only gonna get worse. But the worst part of it all is, I just checked today's date. I'm just kidding, it's all real. You raggedy bitch. The budget for NASA is about $26 million today. The budget for exploring the nonsense in the ocean is less than 20, and this is probably why. That is a deep sea giant phantom jellyfish. And by giant, I mean their bell area can be 3 feet wide and their arms can go to 3.3... Just a smudge. 33 feet long. Now I'm gonna give you some time to guess where Nemo's paralysis demon was found. If you said Florida, right idea, wrong coast. It was actually California. Specifically the Monterey Bay. Except these are usually found a good 22,000 feet below the surface. That's about 6,700 meters and about 15 and a half Empire State buildings. It's believed they dragged their 30-foot arms like nets to snatch up anything that f***s around and finds out and bring it up to its mouth. It's also believed they ate small fish and plankton, but it could eat the devil's ass for all we know, because there isn't a whole lot we do know about them. In the over 120 years we've known about them, we've only ever seen them in live action about 100 times. Mostly because they live in an area code where the water pressure would turn you into a chalk outline faster than Will Smith turned himself into a meme. Not only that, but because they live in the midnight zone of the ocean, where most underwater f***ery calls home, most submarines can't even function that far. It's definitely one of those animals that aren't as bad when you know what they are. The first person to ever see it 100% pulled up to unemployment the next day. Oh, this is gonna haunt me. Nerds of TikTok, what is an animal fact that you know will disturb me? It's the only warning you're gonna get. There's a type of spider that can survive underwater for more than a day. Arctosa fulvolianata is a wolf spider that typically lives in salt marshes and places like that. In an experiment, a scientist wanted to see just how long the wolf spider could last underwater. So he put it under and just waited for it to die. Basically, he waterboarded an animal. But it's okay because science. Anyway, it took almost 24 hours because the experiment couldn't end until the spider did. Except when he did take the spider out, it came back to life. At first, it started slowly twitching, but before the scientist could dial his therapist, it started moving around like it didn't just Eurostep death. 
And that's because these spiders will go into a state of suspended animation. The same one water bears are famous for. When the spider knows there isn't enough oxygen, it'll switch its metabolism from aerobic to anaerobic. And in case you were wondering, that is not f***ing normal. It's like an optional coma. In the experiment, 16 hours underwater was light work for most of the spiders. But at least one of the wolf spiders lasted 40 hours underwater and lived to tell his friends about it. The spider lasted a shift short of two days underwater, and that is now a fact you get to live with. You probably don't have to worry because they're only really found over in- Did you know some spiders can fly? How f***ed up would it be if I just ended the video like that? Spiders will do this thing where they'll climb as high as they can and then shoot a thread of silk into the air. It's called ballooning, by the way. The silk becomes a DIY parachute that carries the spider up in the air where it goes just about wherever the wind, or God, blows it. And some spiders get disrespectful mileage out of it. Sailors have reported finding spiders under ship's sails almost a thousand miles away from land. You know those weather balloons? Scientists have found spiders on those weather balloons 14,000 feet in the air. And in some places in Australia, so many spiders will travel in the air that people will think it's snowing when it's actually just a spider still covering the ground. And sometimes millions of spiders will invade a country. There's a type of spider found originally in Georgia that's found its way halfway across the world, possibly by traveling through shipping containers. And because the Joro spider is basically immune to cold, they started multiplying and became an invasive species. And because of the whole flying thing, there's no immigration control strong enough to stop them. But luckily so far, they're only found in remote parts of the world like the east coast of the United States. There was a group of animals so disgusting that not only did they traumatize a researcher, all of his studies about them had to be hidden from the public. British explorer George Levick literally messed around and found out when he joined an Antarctica expedition in 1911. That's when he came across a colony of Adelie penguins and he decided to stay and observe them for an entire breeding season. He would regret that. Because he found out that Adelie penguins are 50 shades of morally bankrupt. He watched in shock as the male penguins would attempt to mate with literally anything. This included other males, females too injured to resist, and he even witnessed them make moves on unaccompanied and very much underage chicks. It was so vile that in his journals, George referred to them as hooligan cocks. It didn't stop there, in fact, it got worse. There were multiple cases where George watched a down bad bird score with a decomposing corpse, like to the point where males were fighting over it. Because apparently not having a pulse doesn't mean you're off the table. And just to see how far they'd go, he took the frozen head of a decapitated female and propped it against a mound of ice. The answer was far enough. And in one down egregious case, a male made it with the ground to completion. He also learned that if male Adelis understood the signs that a female wants to mate, they could not care less about it. In one case, a female was so crippled that she couldn't even walk, she could only painfully crawl on her belly. A male walked up to the handicapped female and in 60 seconds he managed to destroy everything George thought he knew about them. He wrote down every messed up thing he had learned, but because the contents of his research were so graphically descriptive, the British Museum of Natural History refused to publish it and vaulted it. It was finally published almost a hundred years later, meaning, man's got traumatized in every way and didn't even live long enough to see his work get recognized. Oh, but the worst part? These guys are Adeli penguins. And you can probably guess who the light work is. Stitch this with a fact so ridiculous you didn't believe it until you looked it up yourself. So North American porcupines love climbing trees. Only problem is, they're not good at it. And porcupines will just fall out of trees so often that they'll end up piercing themselves with some of the 30,000 quills meant to protect them in the first place. And apparently porcupines friendly fire themselves so often that their quills are coated with antibiotic grease. And this grease prevents any self-inflicted wounds from getting infected since it inhibits bacteria like tetanus and gangrene. Basically porcupines are so clumsy and so stubborn that God or nature, whatever you believe in, had to give them a healing buff just to keep them alive. Also, a porcupine once fell out of a tree and onto a woman's head, and if that ain't some final destination, John, I don't know what is. What's a common fact that everyone actually gets wrong? I'll go first. Opossums don't actually play dead. They involuntarily go unconscious when they're in danger. And during this stress nap, their heart rate and breathing will slow down, they'll drool, and they'll even release a nasty foul smell to let whatever scared them so bad think they already expired. Basically, they factory reset themselves out of fear. Only thing missing is the- Opossums can cosplay as a corpse for up to four hours. But they're not pretending, they actually go into an anxiety coma as a coping mechanism. You know what? I respect that. You've been wrong about Pikachu your entire life and I'm gonna tell you why. So a lot of people think Pikachu is based on the real life animal called a pika, which is basically just a travel sized rabbit. But the OG graphic and character designer Atsuka Nishida said she modeled his original design after squirrels. The reason was because she said she was just really into squirrels. And she wanted him to store electricity in his cheeks the same way squirrels do with food. She also wanted him to have a long tail that she could turn into a lightning bolt. Which you wouldn't find on a pika. If he's not a pika, how'd he get his name? Probably typing. But it was based on a Japanese word to describe a sparkling sound, pika pika. And the word to describe the sound a mouse makes, which is choo choo. Though in English, Pikachu's name would be something like Zap Squeak. Also fun fact, Pikachu's original name was gonna be Jean-Luc. I can see it. <laughs> Uh, 
So baby seals can actually change the pitch of their voice and even raise their voice to be better understood. Two things we used to think only humans could do. It's a bunch of boring sciencey stuff that I'm pretty sure you didn't get on TikTok to hear, but when you change the pitch of your voice to match whatever environment you're in, that's called vocal plasticity. It's like how you wouldn't use the same pitch and tone with a customer as you would with your friends. I would know, I worked in retail and I was fluent in code switching. But Baby Harbor and Weddle Seals can match and mimic the pitch of human voices and even the melodies of songs. It's how after years of being raised by a middle-aged New England man, Hoover the Seal ended up sounding like one. Also, Baby Seals will speak up when they think it's too loud around them. When you raise your voice on the phone because it's too noisy around you, that's called the Lombard Effect. Well, in an experiment, seals would actually raise their voice to be better understood if the environment around them was too loud. It might not seem like much, but remember, we're talking about seals here. And if that doesn't impress you, they can also do this. Can I get a woo? <laughs> 